Ah, teachers, do they matter? I'm sure that social science research can give us clear and definitive answers about whether they do matter. So let's take a look. Shouldn't take very long. Teachers matter a lot. I think that's what this pile of literature says. Uh, Eric Hanushek, one of these guys, goes so far as to say that teachers can make a million dollar difference over the course of a student's lifetime in terms of their earnings. A million dollars. It's no wonder that measuring value added has become such a hot topic in education ed reform. It's also no wonder that U.S. teachers feel under such pressure these days. Now, to be clear, a lot of people don't agree with Dr. Hanushek's calculations about this million-dollar lifetime earnings from education. And many people don't agree that value-added is the way that we should measure teacher effectiveness. So, let's consider instead a little historical context. The point of this is to give you a clearer understanding of where we are in current public policy by understanding where we've come from. One way to understand the oscillations between how we've treated teachers in the U.S. is to see how on one hand we often treat them like missionaries, and on the other hand we try to treat them like professionals. On the missionary side of the coin, you can think of recent reform programs like Teach for America, which, in full disclosure, I was a part of just after college. I went and taught for three years in a rural high school where I taught English and theater arts as part of a, some sort of calling to go and uh, improve the minds of young people, which I could do on a very intensive basis because I had no family and very few friends where I was living. Now, Teach for America itself was proposed by a college student, Wendy Kopp, who wrote her senior thesis suggesting that we should have a teaching corps consisting of really smart people who have just graduated from college and will go out into the poorest communities in order to give their talents for a few years to this noble cause. We even had a missionary-style mantra. One day, all children will be able to obtain an excellent education. Now, Cop wasn't the first person to come up with this idea of teaching as a missionary-style calling. In fact, in the 1960s, the Lyndon Johnson administration cooked up this program called the Teacher Corps, which was very similar to Teach for America in many ways. But perhaps the most meaningful missionary education program in the United States was back in the 1830s and 1840s. Catherine Beecher cooked up the idea of a board of national popular education. This board would send a wave of religiously inspired single women out into the rural sticks of the Midwest in order to improve the lot of the rural children there who would otherwise live in ignorance illiteracy, and atheism. These women were called to act as a new source of moral power, in the words of Beecher. Teacher training wasn't particularly more sophisticated than the kind of training I got in a crash course summer for Teach for America. And women were set up in sex-segregated normal schools, that is, the expression for teacher training academies, in order to get what they needed to go out and do that teaching. Now, Beecher and company changed teaching around 1800, almost all teachers in the United States were men. Beecher helped lead a movement that changed the classroom from being nearly all men to being nearly all women. She helped play up stereotypes of male teachers as being too lazy and incompetent, too uh, intemperate to be able to be good and effective teachers in the classroom. As you can see from this graph, by 1870, more than half of the teachers in the United States were women and that those numbers would continue to increase until the world wars. It didn't hurt that legislatures got by paying women less for equal work. In fact, some of our first equal pay laws came out of teacher professionalization movements. Now, running counter to the missionary trend is the professionalization movement, which helps organize teachers into associations and unions. This takes place around the turn of the 20th century, roughly at the same time that we see professionalization taking place among doctors and lawyers and other groups in the United States. This is what gives us things like teacher licensure, 
tenure, equal pay for equal work, and lower teacher-pupil ratios. As you can see from the trend lines in these graphs, we see a decline in teacher-pupil ratios, and we also see a rise in the number of teachers in the United States. We do get a lot out of the teacher professionalization movement that makes it a much better job than it used to be. We get better pay, we get better training, we get better working conditions when teachers are actually in the schools. But plenty of people think that all this professional apparatus, the licensure, the credentialing, the union rules, that a lot of this stuff is actually getting in the way of good teaching in the classroom. As exemplified by Teach for America, the fact that I could go straight into teaching without any sort of education coursework. A lot of education reformers think that unions make it too hard to fire bad teachers. They also often think that we need to come up with ways to pay teachers for performance rather than basing it sheerly on seniority. Now, as this pile of paper reminds us, it's actually pretty hard to figure out how to pay teachers based on performance. On the other hand, a lot of people think we need to swing further to the side of professionalization in order to improve teacher performance. As education historian Diane Ravitch has argued, Teach for America is no substitute for the deep changes needed in the recruitment, support, and retention of career educators. Our nation's schools need professional teachers who have had the kind of intensive preparation and practice that nations like Finland insist upon. Finland, by the way, is the current country of comparison. In earlier decades, it was Japan. Before that, it was Germany, blah, blah, blah. That's something we'll talk about later. So which is it, a calling or a profession? Do we need to make education easier to get into or harder to get into? How do we even know what makes a good teacher? This series will help us understand how we've looked at this question in the past, and I hope suggest to you ways that we might think about it in the present.